Hello, everyone. My name is Ronnie Cho, and uh, I'm an associate director here at the White House Office of Public Engagement, where I serve the president as the liaison to young Americans. And I want to first say thank you uh, and welcome you to the White House, uh, and thank you for coming to be a part of this very important discussion um, that uh, we're all looking forward to having some good questions and uh, a good dialogue on college affordability, uh, and particularly around the issue of student loan uh, interest rates. Uh, that are, as of now, set to double on July 1st uh, if Congress doesn't act. Uh, I first also want to say very briefly that uh, this issue of college affordability and access has been something President Obama uh, has worked uh, very hard on for the last three years, um, from historic investments in, in the Pell Grant to the uh, American Opportunity Tax Credit. Um, you know, this is a president that believes that these aren't just nice things to do for young people. Uh, he believes this is mission critical for us, uh, for, uh, for us in our, our fight, in our mission to build an America that's built to last, uh, an America that's going to out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world. Uh, we ought to have an educated workforce. We ought to have an uh, opportunity for folks uh, in the middle class to, to get to college, uh, and those who want to get into the middle class, an opportunity for them to pursue their, their dreams and aspirations. And so that's really sort of the nature and the goal of this discussion today. Uh, and we'll also be featuring a panel uh, of officials from the White House uh, and uh, the Department of Education, along with a very special guest, Vice President Joe Biden, who will be uh, joining us uh, later this morning. So I first want to introduce uh, the panel, but uh, who will be moderated by my friend and colleague, Ann Philippic, from the White House Office of Public Engagement, where she serves as a deputy director and, uh, and if you want to come on up, and we'll introduce the rest of the panel. So thank you very much for joining us. And folks on, on live stream as well, we'll have some questions. Uh, we'll be field fielding questions later this morning, so please tweet at don't double my rate, and, uh, and we'll folks uh, here in the audience will be able to, to answer some questions as well. So thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for being here, and thanks to everyone that is uh, tuning in um, from their computers at home. Um, as Ronnie said, my name's Ann Philippic. Uh, I'm a deputy director in the White House Office of Public Engagement, and want to thank you all for joining us to discuss uh, the very important issue of college affordability. Um, we have students and uh, leaders here in the audience at the White House, and as I said, we have folks tuning in from home. Um, and, and this issue of college affordability is something that, um, as you've probably seen, the president has been out um, talking about it for the past few weeks, uh, going across the country, talking with, um, with students, with high school students, with college students, with their parents. Um, and and he's, he's talked with them about um, the issue, as Ronnie laid out, um, that, that, that the need for Congress to prevent interest rates from doubling on July 1st, which will happen if they do not act. Uh, and as Ronnie said, it, it, as this issue is something that's had particular focus over the last few weeks, it's certainly the issue of college affordability has certainly been a priority for this president and for this administration uh, since, since President Obama took office. So uh, we wanted to invite um, some of the president's um, senior officials who are working on the issue of higher education and college affordability day in and day out um, so we could hear from them uh, about, about this issue and, of course, take your questions, which will be a big part of our conversation today. Uh, and then we are very excited to have a very special guest, Vice President Joe Biden, uh, joining us later in the program as well. So um, I do want to introduce our panelists. Um, today we have uh, Roberto Rodriguez, a Special Assistant to the President for Education Policy. We have Eduardo Ochoa, uh, who is the Assistant Secretary for Post-Secondary Education at the U.S. Department of Education. And we have Martha Coven, the Associate Director for Education, Income Maintenance, and Labor at the Office of Management and Budget. So in just a moment, I will ask these panelists to, to speak for just a few moments about this issue, and then again, we will take your questions. Um, but before we, we do that, I just wanna take a moment to ask all of you, um, you're, you're all here uh, at the White House and, and tuning in from home um, because you care about this issue and because you're leaders on this issue. Um, and, and at the Office of Public Engagement, we always encourage 
um, the, the public to, to get involved and, and to spread the word. Um, this is obviously the issue of college affordability is an issue of great importance to young people, to families, to parents all across the country who are, are wondering how they're going to be able to send their, their children to college and to afford it. Um, and, and it's also an issue that many, uh, many people don't have the full facts about. So we really ask you, um, I think, to, to, to help spread the word about the information you hear today, um, both in terms of the fact that, again, if, if Congress fails to act, that on July 1st, um, federally subsidized uh, student loans, that the interest rate will double, um, but also about uh, the programs and the policies of the federal government uh, and the, the Obama administration that relate to higher education. So a couple ways I'd encourage you to do that. Um, first, for everyone here in the audience and those tuning in, I encourage you, if you're on Twitter, to use the hashtag don't double my rate. Um, that's what we've been doing uh, over the past few weeks and, and, and multiple times over the past few weeks. That's actually, that hashtag has been trending worldwide. So a lot of people obviously care about this issue and want to talk about it. Um, also encourage you to, to check out the White House website and the Department of Education website. Um, we, we're using the website whitehouse.gov slash don't double my rate. Uh, also whitehouse.gov slash double if you want to save some time typing. Um, and, and encourage you to check that out and again share it with your friends, with fellow students, with your family, with people that care about this issue. Um, and, and, and stay updated there. So um, with that, after asking all of you to, to, to tweet throughout this conversation and to spread the word as you go home, I'd like to pass things off to Roberto. Well, thanks very much, Anne, and um, welcome to the White House. It's great to see all of you uh, here in our audience, and uh, a special welcome to those of you who are joining us online as well for this important conversation. Um, President Obama has really charted for us a course to build an America that's built to last, and higher education opportunity is a really key goal. Uh, it's a pillar and cornerstone of, of President Obama's vision there. Um, th this is, uh, you know, uh, a, a priority that the president established early in his administration. There's kind of a framing goal that he set, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, reasons why he's focused so um, uh, with such importance on the higher education opportunity agenda. Um, in 2009, President Obama set a goal that says we need to move from 16th in the world back to first in the world in terms of the uh, proportion of young people in our country with a college uh, degree. Um, and he set that goal and trajectory for us by the end of this decade, by 2020. We used to be first in the world, but over a generation, uh, other nations uh, around the globe, Japan, Canada, South Korea, other nations have uh, actually increased their share of young people with a college degree faster than uh, here in the United States. Uh, and so our imperative to really, again, regain our standing uh, uh, in the world with the highest proportion of college graduates is important today uh, more than ever before uh, for a number of economic reasons. And Anne uh, uh, briefly uh, referred to the importance of having all the facts in this conversation, so I want to give you a few of those. We know that over this next decade, uh, the uh, employment and jobs that require an education beyond high school uh, will grow more rapidly than, uh, than other jobs. Uh, and we know in just four short years, uh, by 2016, four out of every 10 new jobs uh, will require some um, advanced post-secondary education and training. Uh, we know that uh, as we look further out uh, into the economy, uh, of the 30 fastest growing occupations, more than half will require some post-secondary education. And we also know that um, our, our college degree in today's economy is still one of the most important pathways to the middle class and to economic mobility. We know that the average earnings of college graduates are at a level that is twice that as high as those with workers with only a high school diploma. So um, the importance of higher education opportunity to really fulfilling the American promise and building an economy that's built to last um, is, is more important uh, today more than ever. It's also important to our collective economy and to restoring uh, America's global uh, leadership 
uh, economically. Um, at the same time, we know that today more than ever, the cost of college is really putting the American promise out of reach for too many Americans. Uh, and access to higher education has become uh, increasingly expensive for families. Um, this is why we're here today. This is why we're having the conversation today around college affordability because as many of you have um, noted, um, uh, this is a um, uh, debate that is beginning to uh, uh, pick up uh, currency uh, in the media and we know that now uh, Americans more owe, uh, owe more on their student loans than they do on their credit cards. Uh, we know that we have some of the best colleges and universities uh, in the world, and yet tuition and fees at America's colleges and universities has more than doubled over the past two decades. And today, graduates who are leaving our colleges and universities eager to enter the workforce are left with college debt that averages more than $25,000. So this affordability challenge uh, is, is one that we have to take, we believe we have to take head on. Uh, and we have to, we believe can't be an impediment uh, to really increasing college uh, access and attainment. Um, this is why the President um, most recently uh, has really called on Congress to do more to make sure that we're keeping student interest rates low. Um, we've had debates in the uh, House of Representatives. Most recently, we've seen a Republican filibuster of the President's proposal in the Senate. Um, we're going to continue to keep working with Congress to make sure that um, for 7.4 million uh, uh, borrowers, we keep these interest rates at 3.4%, uh, and we keep those interest rates low. The clock is ticking on this. We have a July 1 deadline. If we reach July 1 and this has not been fixed, those interest rates jump back up to 6.8%. We believe that uh, in today's economy, uh, we have to do more to make sure that we can keep these um, these rates uh, affordable and these uh, uh, loans affordable for, um, for millions of Americans. And uh, over the course of that loan, that means about $1,000 in savings um, for those Americans. Now that's obviously um, uh, coupled with a whole host of uh, uh, higher education reforms that the President has really shepherded through over the past three years. It really began with his work in making sure that we shored up the Pell Grant. Um, which is a lifeline of support for now over 9 million college goers. Uh, and we've increased that grant by $905 um, in terms of the maximum grant um, under Pell. Uh, Pell, we saw, had been flatlined um, pretty much um, uh, over the course of the last decade. Uh, when we came in in 2009, we were able to increase that. Uh, the President ushered in uh, the largest expansion and reorganization of the student aid system and was able to effectively close loopholes um, that um, were providing federal subsidies to banks, subsidies that we couldn't afford in particular when college affordability was becoming such a big challenge for our students. And we were able to reinvest uh, over $40 billion uh, of dollars that were, uh, would have gone to financial institutions to really put that back in the pockets of students uh, in the context of Pell Grants in the context of uh, doing more to invest in uh, our community college system. Uh, and the President has reinvested some of those savings in shoring up uh, pathways to community college and training uh, for more Americans, to reinvest in some of our minority serving institutions, our historically black colleges and universities, our Hispanic serving institutions, our Asian Pacific Islander institutions, uh, to make sure that we're doing more to open those pathways of higher education attainment for more of our, uh, more of our minority students across the country. Uh, and at the same time, we've also done more to make sure that the tax credits that are uh, afforded to our students and to their families are robust and really are making a difference around the college affordability. So we've tripled those tax credits, and over the course of four years, that means $10,000 uh, in tax savings that families can uh, can glean um, with the American Opportunity Tax Credit. Again here, the President has asked and called on Congress to make sure that we're making that tax credit permanent um, so that more of uh, our families are able to rely on that uh, as their students go on to college. Finally, uh, we need to also make sure that we're doing more to make sure that on the, on the tail end as students are graduating from college, uh, borrowers can really manage their debt. And as I mentioned, um, that average debt is upwards of $25,000. Um, so we need to be sure that uh, as uh, more of our college graduates are entering the economy, 
uh, they're able to really uh, manage their student loan payments. And this is why the President has done more to really expand the income-based repayment program. This is a program that the President talked about last fall. Uh, in terms of the expansion, and we've moved that program now so that this year um, borrowers, uh, as they um, repay their loans, will have the option of pegging their monthly repayment to 10% of their income. That um, ensures that they're able to afford those student loan repayments uh, over the course of the loan. Um, those students who uh, end up um, keeping up with those repayments over 10 years and entering public service can have the remainder of that loan debt forgiven after 10 years. Um, for the remainder of folks that may not go into public service, the remainder of that um, don't, uh, loan debt can be forgiven after 20 years. So these are just a few of the uh, elements that um, uh, make up the President's higher education agenda. My colleagues um, will talk in greater detail about uh, some of these elements. What we want to do today is really have a conversation with you um, uh, about uh, some of the challenges um, you're facing in college affordability and hear from you about what you think we can do, what more can we do at the federal level uh, to really support um, a pathway toward college attainment um, for each of you individually. We know how important that is uh, to your future. Uh, we're here to also tell you it's important to America's future and the President believes if we're going to continue to be the best nation in the world, we have to make sure that um, we're uh, opening uh, college opportunity and addressing this challenge of affordability for all of our students. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. It's great to have you all here. Uh, and it's, 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 for me particularly, it's gratifying to uh, get together with students. I, I miss the life of the campus, but uh, it's very exciting here working with Roberto and our colleagues. Um, well, Roberto did a very uh, thorough job of giving you the, uh, the context as well as some of the highlights of the work that we're doing. I just wanted to add a couple of things in terms of context. If we look at even more long term, it's clear that the United States uh, uh, economic preeminence in the past was driven by the fact that we had the most educated workforce. Uh, this was true way back uh, in the 19th century when universal public uh, education came in uh, and made our workers more qualified. It, uh, it took another major impetus with the, the land grant uh, movement um, and that also created another surge uh, of uh, rising education. Uh, and then the GI Bill was the other major uh, government program that was able to to really um, turbo boost the economy in the post-war era. Uh, so now we're, we're, we're facing a, a similar uh, historical moment in which uh, with the information technology revolution uh, that's going on in the transition to a global information economy, we really need to continue to increase the educational level of our citizens. Uh, and that's what the President has clearly identified and that's why he laid out the 2020 education goal uh, to challenge us to do this. Uh, so the uh, college affordability issue then becomes a potential stumbling block on, that, on achieving that goal, and that's why it's very important that we address it. Um, I think that uh, also it, uh, I want to put emphasis on the, uh, the concept of shared responsibility, because we need to understand what, what the problem with, uh, uh, of where the college affordability problem comes from. Uh, in fact, uh, the majority of students uh, attending college, um, close to 80%, attend public institutions of higher education. And those institutions have traditionally received support funding from states so that they would be able to charge uh, tuition rates to students that were considerably below the full cost of actually delivering that education. Uh, as as uh, the federal government has stepped up in the ways that Roberto indicated in terms of increasing Pell Grants and making more loans available. There has also been a movement, because in part because of the, the financial problems that states have had, where states have been scaling back their support for higher education. So that's another piece here that we're looking for ways to incentivize states to uh, restore or at least shore up their, their level of funding for public higher education so that the uh, added resources that the federal government is putting into education actually move us farther along. Uh, and that's, that's an important piece of uh, one of the two programs I just wanted to highlight for you. 
that we're working on in the Department of Education. Uh, the first one is, uh, we're calling it Race to the Top, College Affordability and Completion. Um, In-house, we call it Race to the Top for Higher Ed. And uh, it basically will have a certain similarity to the Race to the Top uh, program that uh, took place for K-12, in that it will be aimed at states, and it will, it will be competitive, and uh, it, states' successful applications for funding in that program will depend on demonstrated commitment to a number of, of measures designed to, among other things, uh, keep college affordable for our students, as well as uh, improve the efficiency of the system and reducing the underlying costs. So that's a, a major program that will start uh, in the 2013 proposed budget, uh, which started $1 billion and hopefully would continue for several years after that. Uh, the other major program, uh, it's smaller, but it's, I think, potentially very significant, is FIRST in the World, which is a program that will run under the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education, and that one is aimed at institutions. And uh, this is really designed to foster innovation uh, in teaching and learning, uh, aimed at increasing not only effectiveness and, and quality, but also productivity and efficiency, which is an, another sort of tool uh, in the arsenal that we have to uh, deploy to attack the problem of college affordability. Uh, and finally, there, are, there, are, um, there is a cluster of programs that provide campus-based student aid, uh, the Supplemental e Educational Opportunity Grants, uh, the Perkins Loans, and Federal Work Study. These programs would uh, collectively be boosted in terms of their funding to uh, about $10 billion. Most of the increase would be through the Perkins Loans. Um, and uh, they would be also uh, distributed under this, uh, the proposed uh, budget uh, on the basis of uh, demonstrated effectiveness by institutions in actually uh, reducing or keeping costs down, uh, improving graduation rates, and serving uh, lower income students, as opposed to a formula that, that historically has been used that tended to uh, benefit uh, institutions that were just early on in the, in the system. So that's another way of creating incentives at the, at the individual institutions level. So these are some of the things that we're doing. But uh, clearly the issue of the day is the interest rate. Uh, and uh, this would be a, a major setback. Uh, and in the current landscape, if that interest rate doubles, that we would take a hit in terms of our ability to move forward on this, uh, on this agenda. So it's very important that before that July 1 deadline uh, arrives that uh, Congress act and keep the interest rate at 3.4%. Uh, Thank you. So I'm going to close out here by talking a bit about some of the budget battles that are going on on Capitol Hill and the discussions we're having about priorities and, and where to spend our resources. Obviously, you know, the top, the leading example is this question about um, whether we're going to prevent student loan interest rates from doubling on July 1st or not. The president and um, some of his colleagues in Congress have a very different vision about how we should make sure that happens. We've got a bill that passed the House of Representatives that would pay for that um, interest rate to stay down by cutting uh, funds that go to preventing um, health care um, difficulties, including preventive measures for women and cancer screenings and what have you, these very different visions that we have about how we should move forward here. And that's a really a central debate that I'm sure the Vice President will return to. What I'm going to talk about is just looking beyond that. We have much broader budget um, discussions going on over the course of um, the spring and into the summer and fall and winter. And I wanted to lay out for you a bit of what, what the President's vision was, which you've largely heard from Roberto and Eduardo, and the con contrast that's provided by the House budget resolution that was passed recently, and a piece of which they're debating on the House floor this week. So um, in February, the President put forward a very serious proposal that um, had deficit reduction measures in it, quite substantial deficit reduction measures in it, but also managed to maintain some critical investments, including in education, and you heard about many of those. This spring, the House of Representatives passed a plan that is very, very different and offers a very different vision for the future, including a very different vision for education. This is a plan that would direct even more tax breaks to very wealthy individuals, including those making over a million dollars a year, getting an average tax break of $150,000. 
Um, I don't know about you, but that would have paid off my student loans quite nicely. Um, and that, that's, that's just one piece of this house plan. It also preserves um, taxpayer giveaways to oil companies and hedge fund managers and really propping up those who are already doing quite well. Um, those are costly measures. How would they pay for it? They pay for it, number one, by essentially ending Medicare as we know it, really converting that program, which is such a bedrock for senior citizens and others, to um, a much different vision for the for the future, and by breaking the very tough deal that was made last summer, a bipartisan deal on where we should set our overall levels of spending, particularly for the annual um, appropriations bills that go through, which carry a, a significant share of education funding. So um, keep in mind that the Congress and the President have already agreed last summer and in a number of round, a number of other measures to put um, this annual, especially the non-security, so we're not talking about defense, but the rest of the annual appropriations bills on a path to have the lowest level of spending as a share of the economy since Dwight Eisenhower was president. So we're talking about your grandparents or great-grandparents' generation. We're already on that path. We have already cut way back. The House um, budget resolution would take us far, far beyond that. And it calls for, on top of those agreements that we've already made, cutting an additional trillion dollars over the next decade in these annual non-security spending programs. Um, starting in 2014, for example, this would mean a cut of about 20% um, if, it's, if it's done evenly across the board in just about every program in that area. So what I'd like to do, it's hard to overstate the impact of this. I'm going to talk in a moment about the education impacts in particular, but uh, this is the part of the budget that makes sure that we can um, enforce the laws that protect our clean air, clean water, the safety of the food that we eat, job training programs, research and development, the social safety net that protects women and children and people with disabilities and seniors, and just a big part of what the federal government does and the society that we are and the investments that we've made. But let me focus in particular on some of the impacts on education programs. Um, first, um, Roberto mentioned the, the commitment, and Eduardo echoed this, we have to campus-based aid, including to work-study jobs. The president has actually called for doubling the number of college work-study jobs over the next five years, and has provided, provided for an increase for work-study in his budget. If you took the 20% cut in the House um, budget plan, that would force the elimination of 125,000 jobs. So taking us backwards rather than moving us forward in terms of work-study opportunities for college students to help um, pay for um, pay for college and, and build some important skills. Secondly, Pell Grants, which have been mentioned here. This is obviously, as, as Roberto said, been a high priority for the President, an area where we have um, directed working with Congress uh, some increases. We are seeing the Pell Grant increase in this coming year to keep up with inflation. That's really important. Under the, the um, plan passed by the House of Representatives, if Pell were subject to that same 20 percent cut as the other um, programs in the annual uh, non-security budget, we would see nearly 10 million students getting their Pell Grants cut by an average of $1,000. That's taking us in the wrong direction. Uh, just two more examples of areas where the, this House budget plan has called out for cuts that take us, again, in the opposite direction from this, this administration, and I, I, I imagine from your priorities. The, the House Republican budget called for repealing the income-based repayment plan that, that Roberto described, the pay-as-you-earn approach that helps make sure that coming out of college, your loans stay affordable and th that your repayment is gauged with your income so that um, it's not competing with other, other needs that you have. The, the budget suggests that a reasonable plan might be to get rid of that option altogether. And finally, coming back to another issue that um, Roberto touched on, the, the House Republican budget suggests that we should get rid of the mandatory funding that's going to um, community colleges to help build their ability to have effective programs that are connecting their students, and this is where about half of, of college students today are, is in community colleges, make sure that they're connected with um, good programs that are leading to good op job opportunities, working with local employers. The President's made a priority to invest there, as Roberto said. The House Republican budget plan says, forget the guaranteed funding for that, just kind of see what you can come up with. So in short, these are, I think, very different visions for the future of our country, for the economic opportunities that young Americans would have in the coming years, and these are really important um, budget battles that we are frankly in and will continue to be in and, and hope that your voices can be added to those debates. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you to all of our panelists, uh, to Roberto and Eduardo for 
that great overview of, of administration policies. Uh, and for Martha for talking about uh, the, the House Republican budget and just generally what's at stake. I think that's a really important part of this conversation uh, and a lot of what we'll be talking about in, in the coming months. So thank you all for that overview. Um, so now we are going to move into the, the question and answer part of this. Um, as Roberto said, we really want this to be a conversation. We want to take your questions. We also want to hear from you, I think, about um, the, how this, this issue is affecting you. Um, you, I think, all come with stories, whether it is um, from, from your own experience or from friends or colleagues uh, on college campuses across the country. Um, so I want to hear from you. Also, again, want to encourage you throughout this conversation to, um, to share what you're hearing today um, via Twitter, again, with that hashtag, uh, don't double my rate. Uh, and I also know that many of the folks in the audience um, coming into today's event collected questions um, from, from members of, of student organizations across the country or from uh, your friends uh, on college campuses. So uh, we'd love to, to hear not only from those in this room, but, but uh, through you um, from questions from, from other students across the country. Also want to encourage those tuning in um, from home uh, to tweet using that hashtag, don't double my rate. And for those in the audience that are paying attention to that hashtag, if you see a particularly uh, good question, um, feel free to, to, to stand up and, and uh, ask on behalf of that person from home. So with that, um, I know, Ronnie, we have a, a few microphones um, and, and want to invite you all to, uh, to, to raise your hand if you have any questions. Right over here. Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Josh Hallman. I'm a proud graduating senior at GW just down the street. And uh, my question is, obviously, the big issue right now, and the issue we should be focusing on, is the rate doubling coming up. Um, but in regards to the deeper issue, how, what is our understanding, and how do we address the, the underlying issue of rising costs? And to borrow the phrase from the healthcare debate, bend the cost curve on the underlying costs that this is all really just addressing. Great. Roberto? I think I'll, I appreciate the question, Josh, and let me uh, uh, offer some uh, insights, and I know Eduardo and, and Martha may have other thoughts to share here, too. I think fundamentally what we're after is uh, to promote uh, a new change in our higher education system, uh, to focus on innovation and to focus on uh, new strategies uh, and new practices that will promote efficiency and productivity in higher education. Uh, as Eduardo shared, this is uh, a shared responsibility. Um, uh, the issue of addressing college affordability has to be an all-hands-on-deck proposition. We have a role to play in making sure that we're shoring up our student aid system and doing all we can to keep loans affordable and to make sure we're providing the tax credits and the grants that are needed to be able to support uh, college affordability and make sure that our students are able to afford college. Uh, states have a, a strong role to play here, too. Uh, as was noted, two-thirds of our students are in state-level institutions. So uh, doing more at the state level to promote affordability and to make sure that our institutions of higher education at the state level have the resources they need to, uh, to keep tuition low for students is critical. Uh, just in this past year, we've seen 40 states cut their higher education budgets. And this is something that the President has talked directly to governors uh, about when they visited him here at the White House earlier this year. Um, it's really important that our states assume a greater responsibility to keep college affordable, uh, in particular at our state colleges and universities, because those are such important institutions uh, for so many of our students. Uh, and then finally, we believe that our institutions have um, a role to play and a responsibility to foster change in how they uh, how they keep college affordable for their students. And that means some institutions need to look at how they can drive new efficiencies and how they budget and how they uh, organize uh, their backroom operations, their energy efficiencies. Um, it also um, invokes a new change in how we uh, promote teaching and learning at our colleges and universities. And I think we're seeing some new uh, innovative models around uh, delivering uh, uh, course courses at our colleges and universities using technology, using new methods uh, to make sure that our students are provide are getting a great quality education while ma while also controlling some of the costs. Uh, ultimately, what we want to do is to promote a stronger value proposition 
on the part of our students and our families. We want to be sure that uh, our students and families, and we haven't talked too much about this yet this morning, have the information they need to be able to seek out um, uh, uh, education that's going to be affordable and provide good value. Uh, and it's the responsibility of our higher education sector, just as it's a responsibility at the federal and state level, to promote value uh, in our higher education system. Well, I think uh, and Roberta's put it very well, but uh, there's a few other observations I would add. It, it really is, a, um, higher education is a very heterogeneous uh, industry, if you will. Um, and, but it has some similarities with healthcare. Um, and, uh, you know, you, to really understand the dynamics of it, first of all, the reality is that public higher education's costs have remained essentially flat. Although, to be truthful, that has been primarily because of budget pressures. They haven't been able to add to their costs. Uh, the reality is that, uh, it, as in healthcare, the, 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 the sort of elite institutions kind of set the pace. They set the benchmark. And those institutions have a kind of dynamic where uh, they actually advance themselves as institutions by providing richer and more costly experiences for our students. So there's really no real emphasis on cost containment. Instead, it's about adding features, enriching the experience. And so we're looking for ways to change that, 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 that structure, that dynamic. Uh, it really would require a, a cultural transformation. Uh, in our institutions where our faculty would start to actually devote their ingenuity and creativity, which they have in spades, uh, to finding ways to do things more efficiently as well as to do it better. That's really what it will take. And, and our, our, you know, we're trying to, through these programs to create those sorts of incentives. Uh, particularly, I think the FIPSI program uh, can help maybe um, change a little bit the dynamics so that faculty who do take this uh, challenge uh, on are actually uh, rewarded and recognized and those kinds of activities gain prestige in the academy and uh, will influence that all-important uh, retention, tenure, and promotion process. Great. Uh, next question. Right here. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Elliot Bell Krasner. I'm also a proud graduate of the George Washington University, and I'm going to be getting my master's degree from American University in just a few days. Um, first of all, um, appreciate you being here this morning and appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be here. Um, you know, you mentioned, for example, um, the, the budget proposed by the House of Representatives. I think, you know, you won't get a, an argument from many people in this room that this has been one of the most unproductive Congresses, you know, really in 50 years, follow, which followed one of the most productive Congresses in 50 years, uh, which is just really remarkable and, and very disturbing. Um, President Obama did a really brave and really wonderful thing um, uh, last September, um, when he uh, used uh, the authority granted to him uh, with regards to ESCA um, to try to end some of the more controversial provisions of No Child Left Behind. Um, and uh, you know now the waiver process is, is going through. And he did that because of the legislative gridlock in the hopes that you know it would force Congress to be able to do something. Um, and I wonder, I suppose, you know, given the fact that we're in a situation right now where the House and the Senate can't seem to agree on anything, what can we do to be able to educate people throughout the country about the necessity of this? And what do you think really realistically can be done? Do we need to do this piecemeal? Do we need to pass certain pieces of legislation you know, that focus on certain things that don't have to do with the greater budget because I'm just wondering what's going to get this done to prevent not only the rates from doubling but also just lower the cost of you know, higher education in the long term. Well, uh, I'll weigh in and say I think, um, I think you're right that, that uh, this, uh, this Congress, there are many things that they haven't acted on. Actually yesterday, uh, or I guess uh, yes, yesterday the, the President laid out a to-do list for Congress, um, which talked about five different um, things that he proposed would really need to get done to create jobs. Um, so certainly the President is, is constantly pushing Congress to take action. Uh, in terms of this issue of student loan interest rates, I think what we have seen uh, and what has uh, caused uh, Congress to take action when they have is when they're hearing from um, their constituents that the issues matter to them. 
Um, that is, is what, what, where action comes from. So I know that a number of um, groups that are represented here have actually, throughout the past few weeks, been doing a tremendous amount of work of placing letters to the editor, um, opinion pieces, um, hosting events across the country, um, and, and I think really lifting up stories of real people, of students and families who would be affected by this, who simply cannot afford the potential um, doubling of these rates. Um, and so I would say that, that just from our perspective of, of sort of watching it all play out, um, that's, what, that's, where, that's where action comes from. I think a perfect example of this is um, the payroll tax cut debate um, that some of you guys might have been paying attention to. This was right before um, the holidays um, in, in late December. Um, and there was sort of a deadlock um, and things weren't moving and people wondered if the president would even be able to you know, go with his family on vacation and spend, spend Christmas with them. Um, and then suddenly there was this sort of swelling um, of, of voices across the country. Um, this was people use the hashtag $40 to talk about what, like what $40 um, for every, um, um, for, for, for every time you get a paycheck, what that means to you, what that means to your budget. And then suddenly you saw the whole debate shift. Um, and I think that's exactly what, um, what I think looking at this issue of student loan interest rates, seeing just in the, fat, the last few weeks how this issue has progressed on, uh, on Capitol Hill, um, I think that, that speaks to the power of all of those uh, in this room and, and who you represent across the country. Okay, um, over here. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so I have a question about, or actually two very specific questions related to the debt forgiveness after 10 years. Uh, the first is whether that's permanent or whether that's potentially on the chopping block. Uh, and the second is how that applies to the public service requirement. Um, you know, I plan on going into public service when I graduate. I'm currently rising junior at American University, but I plan on going into public service for some time. I don't know if I'll be in public service for 10 years. How does that work? Thanks so much. So these are, um, thank you for the question, these are elements that uh, were put into place in um, the Higher Education Act. The income-based repayment program is actually a, a provision that was in the um, 2008 Higher Education Opportunity Act that Congress moved forward um, and, and uh, put in place these provisions to enable uh, some of the loan forgiveness after 10 years and then after 20 years um, with those um, various windows. What the President's done is to make that um, uh, program more generous uh, and to move up those terms so that borrowers um, sooner are able to actually take advantage of those provisions uh, and also to move the uh, repayment uh, for the monthly income from 15 percent down to 10 percent. Um, so and, and we're uh, currently working on really redesigning that program so that it's um, really easier for uh, our borrowers to use um, so that it's more recognizable as a pay-as-you-earn program. And so um, with um, a few clicks of the mouse, um, more of our uh, borrowers are able to actually um, uh, apply for this income-based repayment. Um, if you enter public service after 10 years uh, and you commit to that public service um, uh, for a minimum number of years, I don't think it has to be a full 10 years. Um, that uh, loan, the balance of your loans can be forgiven if you're participating in the income-based repayment program. Um, you have to make sure that you're maintaining um, your payments with those loans, you're keeping those up to date, uh, and you have to kind of stay enrolled in the program uh, up to that point. Maybe take a question on this side? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm Andy McCracken, I'm with the National Campus Leadership Council, and over the last couple of weeks we've had uh, about 240 student body presidents sign a letter as a call to action for our national leaders to uh, address student debt uh, by taking the first important step of keeping interest rates low. Um, so over the last week now we've seen uh, the bill pass through uh, the House and the Senate seems to be punting the issue um, because no one, neither side can really agree on the pay for. Um, so. Brett Hiley, one of our presidents from Purdue University, uh, tweeted in the question asking, is there potential for the White House to lead negotiations for a pay for that enough members of both parties can agree on? So are there real negotiations happening and what role, if any, um, is the administration playing in that? Thanks for the question. Um, you're right that we've had 
attempts to pass bills in both chambers in the Senate, there was um, majority support, but as you and many of you probably know, you need 60 votes to get anything through the Senate, and that's where it fell short. Um, the, the President has made very clear, and the administration's made clear, we, are, we stand ready to engage with the Congress on discussions about how to make sure that bill gets signed into law. There are a number of different, um, quote unquote, offsets in the President's budget, measures that would achieve savings, um, deficit reduction that could be used to offset um, the student loan bill. And we have um, made very clear that we are open to a conversation about how to do that. We thought the way that the Senate did it made a lot of sense, and we're supportive of that. If, it, um, if there's a need to find something else, that's as long as it's something that's not hurting middle class families or hurting college students, which would defeat the purpose of actually advancing this legislation. And I think that's the debate that we're in, and that's why we've pushed back and said it's not acceptable to pay for keeping student ring rate loads by rate, student loan rates low by denying um, women you know cancer screenings or what have you that that's a step backwards not a step forwards but we are very open to that conversation have made that really clear great next question maybe Ronnie right here Good afternoon. My name is Miracle Albans, and I'm a junior studying psychology at Virginia Commonwealth University. And I have a question from a friend, Daphne Robinson, at Towson University, and she asks if the government is going to instill any other financial assistance to those who are not eligible for Pell Grants. Well, so I would say, you know, there's um, a host of um, uh, student aid programs that are available to those that may not be Pell eligible. We have the Stafford Loan Program, uh, and um, uh, that's an uh, important um, loan program. We want to be sure that, uh, and want to refer anyone um, who's uh, watching or those of you here in the audience to learn more about um, the suite of uh, student aid um, tools and loans and grants that are available at at www.ed.gov. Um, you know, there also are, um, uh, a whole, we have the income-based repayment uh, program, which is another source of support um, for students, and the Perkins Loan Program, um, which is another uh, uh, loan program that right now only a select set of institutions are, are, um, are uh, receiving um, support for Perkins loans. Um, one of the President's proposals that um, Eduardo and Martha spoke to um, would restructure that program and expand that program really to make Perkins loans um, uh, available to more students uh, and also to incentivize um, uh, institutions that keep costs low and provide good value to their students um, to incentivize a greater share of those dollars for those Perkins loans to flow to those institutions. So those are just a few uh, ways we're uh, addressing the college affordability outside of the Pell Grant. Just to add, Roberto, you mentioned earlier as a reminder, the American Opportunity Tax Credit, which is $10,000 over the course of four-year college education, is available very broadly through the middle and upper middle class. And that's another complement to the Pell Grant in terms of direct assistance to families paying for college. That's actually a, a, a program that doesn't get enough visibility, really, because when you look at the, the, the scale of that, it's comparable to the Pell Grant program. So. Uh, it really is providing a lot of assistance to households. Great, let's take a question on this side. Um, maybe right, right there. Hi, my name is Dion Jones and I go to American University. Um, I feel that we are talking very present and what I mean by that are for those students us who are in college now and for us when we leave. Um, but when I think of college affordability, I'm from the inner city of Atlanta, um, if you're familiar with Atlanta, I'm from uh, around the AUC area where Morehouse, Spelman, and Clark is, and it's a very urban area, um, at-risk youth, all the whole nine yards. Um, and when I think about my neighborhood and the young people in my neighborhood, and there are many young people like the ones in my neighborhood across this country, um, it's the idea of the education behind college finance. We have a lot of families who don't know how to fill out a FAFSA. We have a lot of families who don't um, know how to sign up to take the SAT. We have a lot of people who, in my neighborhood, who are extremely late when it comes to filing their taxes. So even if, when you're extremely late in filing your taxes, you can't even fill out the FAFSA form. So how do we educate the, and so I would say the, these types, of, these types of neighborhoods, these types of people, these urban areas, these individuals living in poverty, 
where this is not the first thing on their mind. And a lot of the types of conversations that we had today where if we would have this in my neighborhood, the majority of the people there wouldn't know anything of what we were talking about. Well, I, that's a very important point you raised, and, uh, and we do have uh, a couple of major programs that address that, uh, Upward Bound and Gear Up. Uh, those are programs that we run out of uh, the Department of Education uh, that are specifically aimed at um, uh, supporting students in uh, high school uh, and sometimes even middle school, uh, getting them focused on uh, the goal of uh, attending college and also providing assistance on all of those things, you know, all of the roadblocks that are potentially out there. Now the thing about these programs is that as valuable as they are, they're only reaching a small fraction of the students that really need those programs. And so uh, I think that uh, one of the things that we are going to be thinking about uh, uh, in the future, uh, at some, someday we'll have a, a new Higher Education Act, and uh, is to somehow uh, you know, refocus or, or sharp, there's really two ways to go in this, I think. In order to be able to reach greater numbers, you either have to expand the scale of these programs or find a way to make the federal contribution uh, act more like a catalyst or seed money for things that can then get started and can go on on a uh, sustainable basis on their own, and then that support can move somewhere else. And so over time, you reach a larger number. One of those two strategies has to be followed right now. We're not doing that. We just have support, but too, too small a, a fraction of the students. I, I, let me just also add to that. I, I think inherent in your question is the importance of making sure that college is a, is a proposition and a prospect that all of our students are appreciating early. Uh, and we have to do more to shore up some of these programs that, um, that uh, Eduardo spoke of, um, Gear Up and Upward Bound, which are great um, pipelines to college but also make sure that our entire education system, um, beginning in, uh, in primary school, in elementary school, and all the way through high school, really is oriented toward this goal of college readiness for all of our students. And that we begin to get information in the hands of parents and of students early uh, uh, about college, um, that we have more students uh, beginning to fill out the FAFSA early, um, our administration has taken historic steps to simplify the FAFSA form. We've put the FAFSA online. We've cut in half the amount of time that it takes to complete the FAFSA. And as the president has often said, you shouldn't need a PhD to be able to fill out the FAFSA. Some of these forms used to be historically just so onerous for families, and in particular for families and first-generation college-going families. Um, uh, we need to be sure that that's a simpler process for our families. We also need to be sure that our families have the information that they need to be able to navigate the college-going experience and comparable information about institutions of higher education, how much they cost, what types of degrees they, they, they offer. Uh, and this is why uh, the President has proposed a new college scorecard um, that would really uh, collect comparable information from our institutions of higher education and put it in the hands of families. If you think about this, um, college and going to college can sometimes be one of the most expensive propositions for a family next to buying a new house, for instance. And if you think about the experience that a family might have uh, uh, in, in looking for a new home, putting out all of those different um, uh, 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 sheets to kind of know where, where how this home compares to this home, compares to this neighborhood, to this neighborhood. Families need that type of information as they're really uh, navigating the college-going experience for their students. And so we want to be able to provide a simple um, shopping sheet uh, as well as a simple scorecard that provides comparable information about the quality and value that colleges deliver, uh, as well as uh, the kind of demographic data um, um, so that families really can make informed decisions. Uh, and we want to really encourage the use of that um, uh, across the country. We need really a resurgence of uh, a national conversation um, across dinner tables uh, in every home uh, on uh, college going. Great, we'll take a question back there. chapters. Um, thank you so much for your leadership over the past year on college affordability. I mean, from the 
um, from the debt ceiling bill, the symbol of, of uh, partisan gridlock, being able to increase in the Pell Grant program and maintain the Pell Grant program for two years, um, the pay-as-you-earn proposal to expand income-based repayment, and now uh, the president leading this effort to prevent interest rates from doubling uh, since uh, early this year. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, wanted to um, make a quick comment to the audience uh, and then a question. Um, uh, several groups uh, will be uh, heading over uh, to Campus Progress after this to have a follow-up conversation about uh, ways that you can continue this effort over the next few weeks. Uh, so if you want to join that conversation, please find us in the back of the room right after this. Um, the question um, that I have for you is, um, obviously in this economy, interest rates shouldn't be allowed to double. Um, but with a one-year freeze, the economy might not uh, be as robust as it needs to be to allow it to double next year. Um, so buying that one year to have a more robust conversation about what should interest rates be um, in response uh, and how interest rates should be responsive to the economy seems like a conversation we need to have. Um, what is the White House's plan over the next year to start that conversation um, and try to find a long-term solution? Well, thank you for the uh, question, Rich, and for uh, the engagement of PERG in, in this important debate. You know, uh, we're focused right now on making sure that we act before, that Congress can act before July 1 uh, to really do more to make sure that these rates do not double. This is the, uh, the clock is ticking, uh, and it's important that we uh, make this uh, fix and be able to get this freeze uh, enacted so that we can have the time that we need to engage with Congress in a longer term conversation about this and about the interest rates. Um, we believe it's, it's critically important. Um, uh, but we know we need, to, we need to get that action done now. There's 7.4 million borrowers that this could impact. And um, we just don't believe that our students um, should have to pay $1,000 more over the life of their loan. Um, in particular in this economy and in these times. So we want to get this first step uh, across the finish line, and then we want to have a deeper conversation with Congress about the longer-term implications of this. Great. Um, how about right back there? My name is Sam Manafi Libby. I'm a staff person with Campus Progress. Thanks so much for having us today. Um, as you probably know, uh, it's harder for LGBT students to access uh, uh, public financial aid, either because they're part of LGBT families um, and they have a hard time filling out the FAFSA, um, or because they're, they're struggling with um, getting access to their parents' tax returns because of uh, family acceptance issues. Um, w in light of yesterday's announcement of uh, the President's and Vice President's support of marriage equality, um, what are y'all doing to uh, increase access to financial aid for LGBT students, um, whether it's uh, advocating for the repeal of the Defense of Marriage Act um, or improving the FAFSA to uh, be more trans-inclusive or, or gay-friendly. Well, thanks for the, comp for the question. We are uh, doing all we can to really do more to make sure that the FAFSA process is a seamless process and gets in the hands of, of more of our families across the country. And I think, you know, th there's a, a challenge here around uh, awareness uh, of the FAFSA uh, in too many of our schools. Uh, and I think um, uh, what we're hoping to do is uh, to engage our counselors, to engage our educators, our high school educators, our principals uh, in this process around FAFSA completion to get that into more of our um, high schools. And we're beginning to see, you know, there's some encouraging work that's being done here uh, by some of our school districts that are doing things like tracking the number of students and the share or proportion of students in their high schools that are completing the FAFSA, collecting that information at the district level and providing new incentives um, for schools um, to uh, 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 get to a higher rate of FAFSA completion and actually having schools compete on this. Uh, and it's an interesting, we're beginning to see a, a big uptick uh, in certain districts that place a high priority in terms of uh, of the FAFSA completion. So that's just one example. Um, uh, we want to do more to make sure that um, uh, our community centers, uh, our community-based partners uh, outside of the school hours um, have the information they need around the financial aid process and can encourage students to and help students uh, complete that process um, both at home as well as in the community-based setting if they're not getting that support in school. 
Also, I just wanted to say thanks to Campus Progress for the great work you're, you're, you all are doing on this issue as well. Um, perhaps back there? Uh, good morning. Thanks so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Kevin Suyo. I'm part of the Roosevelt Institute uh, Young Professionals Network. And in my day, to, uh, my day job, I actually work for the Department of Education. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, my question is on uh, innovation and uh, higher education. Um, a program like Race to the Top for Higher Education does a lot to incentivize schools to uh, do more innovative programs to increase efficiency. Um, but equally important, I think, is the development of communities of practice. Um, so is the federal government thinking about or doing anything to enable the access to free flow of information among institutions that are really doing the best of the best in terms of this work? Yes, thanks for that question. We are, in fact, doing that. And the, the beauty of that is it doesn't take so much money to do that. Um, we, are, we have a college completion task force uh, in the department that uh, has, has held already a, a summit on best practices uh, to improve uh, retention and completion. Um, and uh, improve pedagogy. And we're also planning another uh, conference uh, around September probably that will address specifically innovation, innovative uses of technology and new pedagogies and advances in cognitive science. And we're going to bring some of the, the most um, innovative and uh, out of the box thinkers and put them together with um, key uh, players in large uh, state university systems that are in a position to be able to diffuse those sorts of innovations. And so, um, and, and those meetings have in fact, um, you know, they, they have a, a significant follow up and people, networks are established uh, and, uh, and so those communities of practice emerge as a result of, of that. So that kind of convening role, I think uh, we are, we're playing and we're very happy to do it and we think it is, it is having an impact. I think we had a question from the young lady, right? Yeah, right there. Hi, my name's Emily Yu. I'm the president at the American University Student Government. And I had a question that was a little bit more specific to campus-based ba campus financial aid um, and more broadly, um, how private and for-profit institutions can better serve students in terms of affordability. And my question is, if financial aid spending is fixed to inflation, how does that affect universities' campus-based financial aid awards, such as Perkins Loans? and federal work study for students, um, because you talked about how you reward universities that keep costs down and serve low-income students, but if a university is only fixing their financial aid contributions to inflation, is that considered an increase, and how does that affect their campus-based aid rewards? Well, I think, you know, we're still working out the details on exactly how we would create these incentive um, structures for institutions on the campus-based aid programs, but the idea is to actually look at the, uh, the net price that those institutions are charging their students and how they're succeeding in keeping that from growing. And then that would impact um, uh, the, the uh, allocation that they would receive out of that program. Great, Ronnie, why don't we take one on this side? Maybe right there, yeah. Hi, my name's Megan, and I'm a young mother, actually, and I know many folks in the room don't have kids, but it will happen to you someday. <laughs> um, I, am, I am more than 10 years out of school, and I'm still paying over $350 a month. Um, and I'm a single mom, and I'm actually the child of a single mom who completed her college education in her 30s. We were really proud about that day. My father never completed school, so it was a big deal for me to do that in my family. And now I have a two-year-old, and I'm looking at my budget, and I would love to be saving that money. I would love to be putting that in my own child's college fund. So I'm wondering how other young parents can get involved. And if you can name some names, who should we call on the Hill that has influence <laughs> on this issue? Because we want to be effective. And I'm going to hope that other young mothers will join me in this, because it's a critical issue, not just for young students, but for working families across the country. Thanks. Well, I'll start, Megan, and thank you for, uh, for the um, question. You know, we, we want to call on everyone here, and those of you who are joining us as well uh, online, uh, to really uh, make your voice heard uh, in Congress. We believe that uh, with respect to the current debate on uh, the interest rates uh, on the federal, federally subsidized Stafford loans, we believe Congress can get this done. This shouldn't be a bipartisan, this should not be a, a partisan issue. This needs to be a bipartisan solution uh, on the parts of millions of students uh, who have gone to college and borrowers who 
um, need this relief. Uh, over the long term, we also want to do more to uh, encourage folks to take advantage of offer opportunities for loan consolidation. And uh, I think there's a lot that can be done to take a look at that. We've made some new opportunities available uh, for loan consolidation um, that we want to commend folks to to begin to take a look and see if that might help uh, mitigating um, the um, uh, repayment rates there. Um, IBR and the income-based repayment program is certainly something that we've talked a little bit about this morning. We believe is an important tool there. Uh, and our, our uh, administration will continue to work um, very closely with um, the servicers uh, across uh, our loan programs to make sure that they're um, doing more to really meet borrowers where they are and to really help. And I, you know, I encourage anyone who's having trouble uh, with their loan payments to really get in touch with their servicer. Um, there are a lot of options that are available um, uh, to be able to uh, try to manage that repayment. Um, we know um, what a challenge it is um, to address this repayment um, uh, challenge, especially in today's economy. At the same time, we know that a college degree is important today more than ever to be able to get ahead. So we need to be sure that um, this system is really working for all of our families, that they have the opportunities that they need to be able to repay and afford that repayment. Uh, and, um, and at the same time, we want to encourage all of our young people to um, go to college, to persist through, uh, and to complete because it's just so important to the future of our country. And I'd also just like to add to that. I think um, you know. I, I think you started by telling your story uh, in your in your question, and I think um, that's what we found is most effective. Is 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 for everyone in this room and tuning in, and um, whether it's single mothers like yourselves or parents that are are you know concerned about this issue. Um, I think the most important thing is to share that story and to do it both through social media or you know talk to your local news, um, write a letter to the editor. Um, I, I, or you know, work with the groups here that are doing a tremendous amount of work on this issue as well. So I think the the most effective thing you can do is is to make to move this conversation from sort of you know behind the scenes what's happening on the hill to how does this affect real people? And I think everyone in this room can can share a story like that. So I uh, would just en encourage you to do that because I think that's what we find um, is the most effective way to to spread the word and and to to see action. Um, maybe back here. Um, hi, my name is uh, Sofia Cáceres. I'm from Paraguay. I'm a George Washington student. Um, knowing, knowing how big of an issue affording college can be for Hispanics and minorities, and as a very proud Hispanic, I'm just wondering what are the next step, steps that the government is planning on taking to also um, ensure college affordability for, for minorities. Thank you. Well, uh, let me um, uh, offer a few um, uh, words on this, you know, first of all, on this student loan interest fix, um, a million of these students that would be impacted of these 7.4 million students are Latino students. Um, and uh, we know that disproportionately our Latino students, our African American students, our other low income students, you know, really depend on our student aid system uh, and, and depend on the federal aid to be able to really be a lifeline toward, um, toward college attainment. Um, so this is why we feel such a strong responsibility to do more here. Um, we need to get more information ultimately in the hands of our parents um, uh, and, uh, and our, in the hands of our Latino families um, uh, to be able to uh, know about the options that they have to be able to address the college affordability question. Uh, there have been surveys that have uh, looked at this. Um, when you look at the Latino community, for instance, um, uh, this is a community that really aspires um, for uh, its children to be able to go to college. And at the same time, um, they are the community that knows the least about uh, things like the Pell Grant, um, which are such an important um, uh, opportunity, you know, that you were looking at upwards of $5,550 to be able to uh, put toward um, uh, the costs of college and university. Uh, so we, we feel a strong responsibility to try to do more to make sure that um, we're providing the information that our uh, families need to be able to uh, navigate this um, uh, student aid uh, system and be able to take advantage of the opportunities that 
that uh, um, are afforded there. And that's important for the Latino community. You know, we've seen some increases in uh, the number of Latino students that are enrolled in college. Uh, but we know that um, we still, uh, as a community, as Latinos, uh, disproportionately uh, have the fewest number of students that are actually completing uh, college when you uh, compare uh, Latinos to other groups. So um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Thank you for the question. Great. I think we have time for probably one or two more questions. Um, maybe one more? Or should we wrap up? OK. <laughs> well, there we go. Um, uh, that means that we have, I think, a very special guest that's about to come out. But first, I just wanted to thank all our panelists for their time, um, for the conversation and their um, thoughtful feedback, and really to thank all of you for being here and for everyone that's been tuning in at home. Again, I really encourage you to, to get involved in this issue. Um, obviously, we got some really great questions. It's something that I think it's clear you all care a great deal about. Um, again, encourage you to use the hashtag don't double my rate um, to go to um, our website, whitehouse.gov, the Department of Education at uh, ed.gov, um, and, and, and gather information and share it through your community. So um, with that, uh, thank you, panelists. And I'm going to introduce uh, Michael Strautmanis, uh, from the Deputy Assistant to the President, who will be introducing the Vice President in just a moment. Thank you. How's it going, everyone? I am not the special guest. <laughs> just want to make sure everybody's like, boy, that doesn't seem all that special. Um, I'm Mike Stratmanis, and uh, I have the privilege of working here uh, as the deputy in the, uh, what I like to call the outreach operation, the front door of the White House. Um, I work for the president's senior advisor, Valerie Jarrett. And uh, I'm so glad you all are here to focus on such an important issue, college affordability. Uh, I'm somebody that went to uh, public school, the University of Illinois in Champaign, got there uh, through a combination of scholarships and, and loans. And I know I wouldn't have been there uh, today and wouldn't be here today if I didn't have that opportunity. Uh, what we do here at the White House is uh, we like to take what could end up being uh, seeming like very dry, mundane issues, uh, and talk about it with real people. Um, and I learned about this every single day from uh, one of the, the president's right-hand man, uh, a leader uh, who has worked on these issues uh, for such a long time here in Washington, someone who, is, uh, who understands the importance of talking about these issues and dealing with these issues with a focus on you, with a focus on your stories, with a focus on your hopes and your dreams. And that's the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden. Hey, everybody, how are you? It's great to be with you. I tell you what, it's nothing like talking to the home team. Please, have a seat. Let me start by telling you how much the President and I personally, genuinely appreciate you jumping into this critically important debate with both feet. And uh, I, 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 want you to, uh, I, I want you to know that um, uh, students, standing up for students, you sticking uh, with us and helping the Congress uh, uh, know how important it is to college students to have some remote possibility of being affordable. And I say remote because almost all of you graduate with debt like my kids did, and accessible. And you know, I want to thank you for getting other students on your campuses involved and making sure that, uh, that they know what this is all about. I mean, I know they know because, you know, one of the things, if I can say at the outset here, one of the things that we focus on 
and this has been my hobby horse since I have been a, uh, a United States Senator. I got elected when I was 29 years old to the Senate. I wasn't old enough to be sworn in. I had to wait because you have to be 30 years old to, I mean, literally, <laughs> I, you have to be 30 years old to be sworn in. But I got elected. The day I got elected, I was still 29 years old. And so I had to wait uh, uh, close to a month to be sworn in. And um, the first bill I ever, ever introduced in the United States Senate was a bill to up the eligibility of people to be able to qualify for Stafford loan, for loans, federal loans to go to college. I don't want to tell you why. I'm going to focus on students in a, for a moment. I want to focus on your parents now. Maybe you experienced what I experienced. What generated my passion for this issue was not so much the help I got, because as Barack and Michelle and Jill and I talk about for real, just like Mike, and he's a really good guy, we talk about we know, and this is not hyperbole, we know there's not a single possibility Barack could be standing as President of the United States or me as the Vice President or Michelle or Jill, where they are, were it not for help. There was no possibility of any one of our families getting us to school without scholarships and or financial aid. And I was a senior in high school, and I was, uh, I was a good student. I was a lousy law student. I was a good student, and I was probably even a better athlete. And so I had a chance of schools looking at me to get me to come to school to play uh, football. And, um, but uh, I, uh, I still needed some help because the schools I was looking to were only grant aid operations. They could give you some help, but there wasn't, you know, the, the only two big schools, that, football schools that looked to me were Maryland and Pittsburgh, and there were big schools, and they probably gave scholarship scholarships. The other schools I was l l looking at didn't give scholarships. They gave some grant name. And my dad was a really proud, like your mom and dad's probably, my dad was a proud, proud, decent man. My dad was one of the most graceful men I've ever known, and... Uh, but he had great pride about his ability to care for his family. And um, if you read about me, it may, people make it sound like I'm Joe Biden who climbed out of a coal mine in Scranton, Pennsylvania with a lunch bucket in my hand. <laughs> my dad didn't go to high school. I mean, he didn't go to college. And, 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 and no one in his family had gone to college. But they were white collar workers. And I lived a typical, typical middle class life in the 50s, late, late 50s through the 60s when I was in school. And um, I remember my senior year in, um, in high school, and we had just finished a baseball game in a school I went to. And I went to school in a little steel town in Delaware called Claymont, Delaware. I'm right on the Pennsylvania border. And um, my dad was the manager of an automobile dealership in Newark, Delaware, where the University of Delaware is. And one of the great advantages of having a dad who didn't make a lot of money but had uh, ran a dealership, for every prom, I got a new car. <laughs> now, you think I'm joking. My, and none of you remember the phrase, but they, I'd get to Simonize a car, make it shiny and look beautiful, and i get to pick whatever one off the lot, the used car lot, but they were nice cars. And I remember after the game, my girlfriend was a junior in high school, and I was going to her junior prom, and I went, I got out of the, the game was over as a home game, took my spikes off, put on sneakers, didn't shower or change, had my baseball uniform on, blew down, was now a 19 mile ride in my 51 Plymouth down and to my dad's dealership. He, I said, where he managed it. Pulled up the spot I usually would pull, and I went in, and the receptionist's name was Mary, as I remember, and said, Mary, where's dad? She says, honey, dad's out in the side lot over there. So I walked out, and my dad, who was impeccably just a real gentleman, was pacing back and forth. And he looked up, he saw me, he said, oh, Joey. He said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I, honest to God, thought something happened to my mom or my sister or my brother. I said, dad, 
well, what's the matter? He said, I, he said, I went to the Farmers Bank, which was a state bank in Delaware, that financed a lot of the loans that people got to buy cars. And he said, I went to the Farmers Bank, and there was a guy named Charlie Delcher, the banker, I remember specifically. Because I ended up going to Charlie Delcher to borrow money to open a law firm years later. And he said, you know, Joey, he said, they won't lend me the money to help you get to school. I'm so ashamed. I am so ashamed. That's the reason why. I probably would have gotten to college somehow. Maybe not that year. Maybe not right away. But I would have gotten to college. But millions of your moms and dads, millions of the people you know, have had their pride stripped from them. The way they finance getting their kids to school is like I finance my kids. I have the dubious distinction of being rated the poorest man in the Congress and the vice president assuming the office of the least assets. I hope they were referring to financial assets. <laughs> and I was making a lot of money when my kids were in school. I was making $60,000 as a senator. But they got into very good schools, and I said, whatever school they get into, I'll help them get there. My boys worked 30 hours a week in school. One worked 30 hours a week, also played football. One went to Penn, one went to Georgetown. The combined cost of going to those two schools exceeded, then, my disposable income. They both graduated significantly in debt. I was able to borrow against my home, like a lot of your parents used to be able to do, because we had equity in the home. I bought a home for a price, and it kept going up the value all during that period of time. And, um, and that's how I got them through school. And when my daughter and my two sons, after 20 years of school, undergraduate and graduate school, I sold my house and helped pay off the loans because they didn't need as big a house. No complaints. I mean, it's not like I had great sacrifice. We didn't need as big a house. That's how a lot of moms and dads used to do it. But this god-awful recession we inherited, they lost their wealth, $16 trillion in lost wealth for middle-class families out there, all in their homes or their 401ks. The stock market plummeted. Even though they kept up all their mortgage payments, guy down the street had a subprime loan, and the guy around the block had one, and they saw all of a sudden their house was upside down. They couldn't borrow the money. So this has become a crisis, not only for a generation, but a generation of parents. Because if there's any parents in this room, you know the most helpless feeling in the world for you is to look at your talented child or your child is ill, or your child has a problem, and know there's nothing you can do to help. So in full disclosure, that's where I start from. That's why, since the day I got in office, this has been something, and one of the great honors of my life is I got picked to be vice president by a man who shares as passionately as I do the desire to make sure that college is accessible and affordable. That's a gigantic priority for us. And here's what we did when we came to office. The first thing we did, and by the way, I'm about to say something about banks. Banks aren't bad guys, for real. You know, there's no need to demonize them. Banks went out there. We were paying banks over a 10-year period $60 billion to process student loans. So we said, hey, this is a no-brainer. They're not bad guys, but let's forget, let's forget them processing the loans. We'll do it and use that $60 billion to help kids get to school, not just middle-class kids, but kids from families in distress. And a lot of families are in distress. So we took $40 billion, and we increased the maximum Pell Grant by more than 800 bucks. And the immediate effect was, instead of having six million kids in college as a consequence of Pell Grants two years ago, nine million. 
Nine million are now in college because of Pell Grants. Three million more. It makes a difference. It makes a difference in their lives. On top of that, we gave an additional help to families by creating a tuition tax credit. There always was some form of tuition tax credit. We said, for every kid you have in school, you get $10,000 for the life of that student's enrollment in college. Credit, tax credit. So if your federal tax is $1,000, go to any four-year college or most two-year colleges, you've paid out 2,500 somewhere along the line, or a lot more. You only have to pay $1,500. In the neighborhood I come from, the family I grew up in, that's the difference between having to keep your car insurance and not keep your car insurance. That's the difference between that's enough to buy groceries for several months. This is just for middle class people, not for poor for middle class people. I love these guys who think somehow a thousand or two thousand dollars more to have to spend in a year doesn't mean much. In my own neighborhood, man, it meant a lot. And it still means a lot. We're fighting to permanently extend that tax credit. Every negotiation I've had is being charged and negotiated with the Republicans on debt and, and the budget. That's the thing they always want us to throw in. What do we need that for? It's not paid for, quote unquote. Yo, Richie, not paid for. How about extending a trillion dollars in tax cuts 800 billion of which go to people with a minimum income of $1 million. That's not paid for. I don't quite get this. And we also want to double the number of work study jobs. Most people aren't familiar with those, except those who need it. Average work study jobs about 1,700 bucks a year. That's the difference in what you get to eat. And in some cases, whether you can stay in school, what your living conditions are if you're off campus. We want to double, double the number of work-study programs. But even with everything we've done to increase aid, we still know that two-thirds of all the students who attend college take out loans to pay for school. And they graduate with an average debt of $25,000. You get a diploma, and you get stapled to it a $25,000 bill. And if you're fortunate enough to have gotten into one of the elite schools, that staple bill is a hell of a lot higher. So that's why we made, and this was the president's idea all by himself, so the president came up with the idea that Anyone with federal loans should never have to pay back more than 10. They have to pay back. You all have to pay back. But no more than 10 percent of your disposable income. That means after you pay for your car, your insurance, your rent, your food, no more than 10 percent of that. You have to pay it back, which means they'll allow you to get out with a debt and still work for a nonprofit means it'll allow you to go out and become a school teacher if you want. In most jurisdictions, they're making around, it varies, 30,000 bucks to start. Well, that makes a lot of difference. It brings down your monthly payment if you're in the $30,000 range, if you have a 25,000 average bill, by about $150 a month. That makes a difference. That makes a difference. These guys did live in a different place. They're not bad guys. I don't think they understand how much $150 a month difference makes to a kid getting out of school. That's what we've done so far. But we need Congress to help us do even more. Now you've all been engaged in this issue, and that is, if the Congress doesn't act, 
interest rates and subsidized Stafford loans, federal loans, are going to double overnight on July 1, less than two months from today. We want to freeze that rate. We want to freeze that rate. Otherwise, more than 7 million students, probably many of you right here, many of your classmates are going to see your interest rates jump from 3.4 percent to 6.8 percent. That's going to average more than 1000 bucks a year. Again, these guys, I think they don't think 1000 bucks makes a difference. It matters. It matters. I don't know how many of you have an extra 1000 bucks lying around. Unless, as the other guy leading the other team said, take a chance. Go home and t get a loan for your parents and start a business. <laughs> so why the hell don't you go home? Get your parents to give you a loan. Phew. <laughs> you know, this week the Democrats in the Senate tried to pass a bill that would have stopped the rates from doubling. The Republicans blocked it. They wouldn't even actually let it come up for a vote. Why? Because they didn't like the way we paid for it by closing a loophole that lets some very wealthy people avoid payroll taxes. The way they do it is they say they'll take X amount as income, 100,000 income, and 5 million in profit this year. The profit is not the income. The profit, it's a long, it's a way S corporations do it. W wouldn't it have been a big deal to those folks. I think if those folks knew what it was, they'd support it too. Rich folks are just as patriotic as poor folks. They're not asking for this extra help. They know the deal. So let me say it again, because I think it bears repeating. These guys are willing to allow the average student loan to go up an extra thousand bucks in order to protect the tax loophole for the richest Americans. One, in my view, I don't even think they would have any problem, any problem contributing slightly to in order to keep college loans from doubling interest rates. That's the Senate. In the House, most of our Republican friends have been against this lower loan rate from the beginning, when Congress first passed it five years ago. Then, just over a month ago, all 10 of the leaders in this particular committee voted for the, uh, uh, for the budget, the Ryan budget, which doesn't even address, make any accommodation for the student loan rate increases. One of them even compared, one of the congresspersons actually compared, I don't want to, I, I want to be, I'm not unfair, but I don't want to be single somebody out, but I will, so rather than tell you his name, I'll read a quote. He compared federal student loans to, quote, stage three cancer of socialism. The stage three cancer of socialism. You all realize you're spreading socialism, don't you? <laughs> Which is cancerous. I've been here a long time, man, but this is... <laughs> it's taking on a new dimension. <laughs> now, thanks in large part to all of you. A lot of folks are beginning to change their mind, including, fortunately, the Republican candidate for president, the, the, the presumptive candidate, as I understand it. Now they're saying they're willing to keep the rates low, but only if we pay for it by taking the money away from preventive health care, things like screenings for breast cancer. This is not a joke. This is real. That's how they want to pay for it. That's a choice we shouldn't have to make. We're committing to working with these guys to find a bipartisan way to pay for this, but we shouldn't have to choose between keeping college affordable and keeping Americans healthy. That is a Hobson's choice if there ever was one. You know, my dad, God love him, used to have a great expression. He'd say, don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget, and I will tell you what you value. Don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget, and I will tell you what you value. Look, these other guys are decent people, but they have a fundamentally different value set than the President and I do. 
the budget they vote for, they voted for, isn't just silent on interest rates. It would cut Pell Grants by an average of $1,000 student by 2014. It would deny existing work study, existing work study programs by 100,000. It would cut existing pro. We want to double it. They would cut existing programs by 100,000. Look, it baffles me that there isn't a consensus in knowing we have to invest in education to help students and their families pay for that education. But they think it's more important to spend hundreds of billions of dollars on tax cuts for very wealthy people, good people, but again, who are not even asking for it. Cuts they don't need, cuts they haven't asked for. I strongly disagree, to state the obvious, but because there's no higher priority than us becoming the best educated nation in the world. A generation ago, a generation ago, we had a higher percentage of our population graduating from college than any other country in the world. Today, you know where we rank? The percent of population graduating from college? 16th. 16th. Forget the issue about equity. Forget about your parents' dignity. Forget about all that stuff. My wife is a tenured English professor. Has a great expression. She said, any nation that out-educates us will out-compete us. I believe the president believes it's overwhelmingly in the national interest of the United States of America to get every qualified person, qualified person, to college. It's just that simple. And by the way, 60 percent of all the new jobs created in the next 10 years are going to require an education beyond high school. 60 percent. The days of making it with a high school education into the middle class are virtually gone. There's all ex always exceptions. But what are we talking about here? I'm supposedly an expert on foreign policy. That's how I lots of times get introduced. Not long ago, I was at a conference with a whole lot of experts from around the world and the country on national security. One of the closing questions I was asked is, what is the single most important thing the United States can do to maintain its security edge over the next 20 years? The answer to me was simple. Have the best educated population in the world. It's in our national interest. Look, the middle class has been devastated, devastated by this recession. Absolutely devastated. Do you know a single person, poor, middle class, or wealthy, that if you ask the parent, do you want your kid to go to college that says no? I don't know anybody. It may be a two-year college. It may be special training or a four-year college or graduate school. But it's the aspiration of every parent, rich and poor. And it's a foundation upon which this middle-class dream has been built. I love these guys. They say, we, we think small. Acts, it acts like the people in my neighborhood grew up saying, all we want to be able to live in a decent house, which we do, in a safe neighborhood, which we do, be having a good school, which we want, being able to send our kids to college if they want to go, and maybe be able to take care of our parents in their elderly, in, in their waning years and with a faint hope that you won't rely on your own children when you get that age. That's all part of what constitutes the middle class. But there's one other thing, and you know it. I was raised in a family where my mother and father never doubted, never doubted I could be whatever I wanted to be. Never doubted. 
that I could be vice president, president, chairman of the board, whatever. Same with my sister, who is genuinely smart. <laughs> but seriously. Also, hope and believe my brother wanted to be a millionaire, he could be a millionaire. It's not like we have cabin notions of middle-class people, like we just dream that we're just going to have a house. It's an undip. But man, you pull out of that equation the ability to get your kid to college. Whether it's true or not, in the minds of the middle-class families I grew up with and now know, that whole house of cards begins to crumble. This is about restoring not only the middle class, but the dream of the middle class, from which the whole country benefits. When the middle class is doing well, the wealthy do very well, and the poor have a chance. They have a ladder up. They have a vehicle. With your help, I'm confident, and I'm not being gratuitous here. With your help, I'm confident we're going to be able to keep interest rates from doubling. Because now is the time, not the time, to make it harder for students to be able to pay for their college or for their college loans. The President and I are going to keep up this fight, and we're glad you're on our side. We need you very badly. So don't leave this White House today. Without committing to me, you'll make a commitment to redouble your efforts. We need to keep the pressure on. So please, tell all the students you work with to call or email their members of Congress. Tell them to tweet with the hashtag, don't double my rate. Tell them to participate in rallies on their campuses around the country. Tell them not to give up until Congress sends the President a bill that stops the doubling of those rates. You're an incredible generation. That's not hyperbole, either. Your generation and the 9-11 generation before you are the most incredible group of Americans we have ever, ever, ever produced. You volunteer more than my vaulted generation of the 60s. 2.8 million of you since 9-11 have volunteered to serve in the United States military. 2.2 million have strapped on boots that have taken them across the scorching sands of Iraq or the God-forbidden landscape of Afghanistan. Thousands of fallen angels. And hear me them tell me, and I read, that your generation is not ready to take on responsibility. God. Folks, you're also, your generation is in the cusp of the most incredible change in world history. Not because of Barack Obama and Joe Biden, because of the time in which you live. Your generation is going to live through us being able to make solar energy as cheap as gas, a coal, excuse me, as, as coal. Your generation is going to see in the near term the ability to literally target cancer cells through the bloodstream, making sure that no healthy cell is killed. Your generation is going to see the regeneration of organs, the regrowing of organs, so they don't have to wait for days and months in the hope of getting an organ transplant to stay alive. Your generation is going to see so much because you're part of such an incredibly bright, talented group of women and men. But a lot of it depends on us remaining the most innovative, best educated, nation in the world. I know sometimes you read that Biden's the White House optimist, like as my grandpa used to say, like I'm the guy that f fell off the turnip truck yesterday, you know, that was his expression. <laughs> Hell, I've been here longer than all of them. 
I'll end by saying I got elected when I was 29. I was characterized as an optimistic, idealistic young man from a modest background. They used to kid me and say, I'm the first United States senator I ever knew. <laughs> but folks, I give you my word as a Biden, I am more optimistic about your future, more optimistic about this country than I've ever been in my whole life. Again, not because of Barack and me. Because of what y'all are made of, man. We are a better position than any nation in the world to be the leading economy in the world in the 21st century. We are better positioned because of the system we have where you can breathe free air, where as Steve Jobs says, you can think different. Innovation only is generated in countries where you can challenge orthodoxy, where you can think different, where you're encouraged. Change only comes through challenge. So let's make sure your generation, once again, is the intellectually the best equipped generation in the world. But we can't do it. We can't do it without, without college affordability. And it's a small but considerably important part of the, p of the puzzle that you don't let these interest rates rise. God love you all. Thank you. And may God protect our troops. Thanks. See you all.